there's all these big winners in pharmacy. There's basically, there was no e-commerce player before PillPack. Like they didn't exist, right? TJ, I am so excited for this. As I said, I feel like I know so much of the PillPack journey from the wonderful Fred Destin. So thank you so much for joining me today first. I am thrilled to be here. This is the first, uh, first public thing I've done in like five years. Um, and obviously I owe a ton to Fred as well. He put on both of us when we were super young. So thrilled to be here. Dan, I am so grateful that this is the first thing you've done in five years, but I want to go to PillPack and that kind of founding aha moment. Obviously, we see the incredible journey today and we see the exit. But in terms of that founding moment, what was that aha founding moment for you? Take me there. Yeah. So I think if you if you go way back, like I grew up in New Hampshire in a family that owned and operated and your classic mom and pop pharmacy. So I grew up in and around pharmacy. Um, and, you know, I actually started school as a business major and pretty quickly realized that it was, I thought it was important to have a technical background, like some specific expertise. And so I switched to pharmacy. But as you can imagine, I never had ambitions to work like behind the counter at a, at a CVS. Um, just knew there was lots of opportunity in and around pharmacy. Um, and I'd done every, I'd worked a ton of different jobs uh, at my dad's pharmacy. So worked behind the counter, helped check people out, actually was delivering meds to people in their homes and saw that experience. Um, I just knew there was a lot of opportunities to make it better. It was super frustrating. It was really complicated. Um, so I was in pharmacy school in Boston um, and doing the classic going down weird rabbit holes in the internet as a as a college student and buying and selling sneakers, got really obsessed with design, thinking about furniture and architecture, and was just very interested in kind of aesthetic. Um, and then very separately got really interested in startups. So um, kind of snuck into MIT and they were super gracious. I didn't I didn't go to school there. Um, but helped run the, the MIT 100K, which was like their business plan competition at the time. Um, and I showed up for the first, uh, for like the, the 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 sort of first meeting with all the students. And they're like, you don't you don't go to school here. And I was like, nope. And they're like, I mean, we're not paying you. So if you want to do some free work, like, I guess that's fine. Um, and then I actually started this thing called Hacking Medicine at MIT with Elliot, my co-founder, um, which was getting just doctors and designers and physicians all together to work on stuff in healthcare. Um, and through that period, kind of like 2005 to 2010, um, my dad had started this totally new pharmacy um, that was sorting and packaging meds actually very similar to PillPack. Um, but they were selling into nursing homes and assisted living facilities. It wasn't a consumer business. Um, and so I always had this idea, like, could you take this kind of core product, but then offer it to consumers and do it in a way that was really kind of design forward and, and aesthetic. And... I think for me, the big challenge was getting the confidence to think I could actually go do that. Like, could I actually raise venture capital? Could I find a real co-founder? Like, just getting like the inertia to believe that that I could do that. Why did you not have the confidence and what gave you that confidence in the end? Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit more of a non-traditional founder, right? I didn't go to like an elite school. I didn't, I didn't have the sort of normal connections that uh, a number of founders do. At least that was my perception. That's probably not 100% correct, but... It was a wacky background, right? I'm a pharmacist. I'm not like a uh, a normal entrepreneur in that context. Um, and in hindsight, like I think it was more my perception than the actual reality. But that was that was the hurdle for me. Um, I think once I once I made that jump, uh, it was all from there. It was very natural. It was more like a snowball rolling down a hill. Um, I kind of I I think it's a lot like if you've ever been skydiving, like jumping out of the plane is really scary but like once you're in the air it's actually pretty chill um and it was like that for sure for me so we pitched it the first time at like hacking medicine which uh is an event that we started so it's kind of wacky but we won the event which is very exciting it was it was uh it gave me the confidence uh for better or worse um this is like the fall of 2012 i'd been a pharmacist for about six months so like fresh out of school and i think within a month or two we were in we got into Techstars quit my job kind of just kind of like January of 2013. Um, but I think that it was for me, it just wasn't an aha moment. It was like, how do we combine like my expertise in pharmacy with my interest in design, with my interest in tech? It was like, how do we put all these things together? Um, and it was a very kind of iterative, natural uh, process in hindsight, right? Obviously that wasn't intentional going into it, uh, but it really was the combination of all these things I was doing and I was interested in that, that ultimately became PillPack. When we hear your background there and the parents' roots in pharmacy and having their pharmacy, your father kind of iterating on that model, it just seems inherently like this founder market fit. How important, I'm just intrigued, how important do you think founder market fit is given the lens that you come from and the experience that you have? 
Yeah, I think it's important in the sense that I think it's really important to understand the customer problem. Um, I think it's less important in understanding like all of the nuance of the industry and dynamics and other things that are going on. Um, but I do think if you don't deeply understand the customer problem, it's likely you'll build the wrong solution. So I think that's where we were uniquely, that's where my expertise was unique. I don't think it was that I was a whiz kid on how pharmacy worked. I think it was that I would spent enough time inside the pharmacy. I'd spent enough time in customers' homes that I, I did deeply understand that problem. And I looked at all the solutions that were out there and I felt like we could offer something that was a lot better. Can you know, I ask TJ, I think we're all, despite whatever we kind of project, I think we're all running from something and we're all the function of our histories. And so before we get into the, the journey in entrepreneurship, I do just want to touch on this, which is like, what do you think you're running from when you think about kind of all being a functions of our past? Yeah. So the folks that have been uh, been following Pillpack over the years will remember this story, but uh, I think I still might actually be running from the FBI. Uh, so back in 2020, uh, for context, there's this company called SureScripts, which is kind of the main broker of data in pharmacy, also controls all the e-prescribing pipes, uh, and may happen to be owned by all the incumbents. And uh, we did this terrible thing, which uh, we were trying to make it easier for for customers to access their own health data and make it easier for them to choose pharmacies that they wanted to use. We've had multiple public spats with, Express, with share scripts over the years, but in 2020, they decided that the right PR play was to do the boogeyman thing of we've called the FBI. Um, so as far as I know, I might still be running from the FBI. What was that kind of boogeyman FBI call for? Like, what were they saying you'd done? I think it was to try to paint us as like bad actors. I mean, that was kind of a, a theme throughout the journey of PillPack. And in reality, we were doing things that made it way easier for customers, uh, but I think it made incumbents uncomfortable. We'll get into a bunch of this, I think, later in the podcast. Um, but that was a constant theme of, we got to find some way to paint these guys that are trying to make this better uh, as uh, as the opposite. What else are you running from, TJ, personally? Yeah, I think maybe to more seriously answer your question. I, I had this conversation with someone a couple months ago that made the comment that kind of stuck with me that we're always probably looking for the opposite of of the environment that we had as a kid to some degree. And I, you know, for me, uh, if you zoom way back, like my dad grew up with almost nothing and worked, worked, worked incredibly hard to become a pharmacist, to, to give us a childhood that was, was way better than his. Um, but it was like a very kind of leave it to beaver childhood, right? Very, uh, very predictable, very stable, just very kind of classic. And I think I was always looking for a little more excitement, a little more risk uh, in my life. And so I think startups were a great way for me to harness that, um, but probably probably led to me being very uncomfortable in uh, very formulaic, stable environments. I think one of the reasons the show has done very well, TJ, is because I have a schedule and I say, fuck it. And I also just go kind of with my heart. I listen to your predictability and stability there. And I'm very envious of children that have predictable parental guidance and predictable childhoods. And I, I, I don't think I really have one at all, and that structure I didn't have. Um, do, how do you think about your parenting today, having had that predictability, and is that what you want to give them or not? You know, I think for me, it's really about giving them an environment to be kids is probably the biggest thing. I don't know if it's as much about predictability versus non-predictability, but I think the, the, the thing that we're trying to provide for our kids is the ability to go explore uh, be kids to be able to have independence and to grow independence early, which I did have in my childhood. Like we we were like classic '80s '90s kids that hopped on a bike and took off and came back before dinner. Um, and so I'm trying to I'm trying to keep that um, because for me that was sort of the magic of childhood was being able to go build forts in the woods and be gone for the whole day. It wasn't uh, it wasn't sort of like my schedule's packed, and I, I want to make sure I provide that for my kids. And certainly, hopefully, our environment is stable. But it, for me, that's the thing I think about a lot is how do I how do I retain a childhood that is, for the most part, now gone for a lot of kids. I have the most wonderful imagery from US films of kind of jumping on a bike and going around picket fence kind of uh, yeah. ecosystems. But I, I want to move from that was like, definitely my childhood. I mean, great. Um, but I want to move from the stability to uncertainty, to instability. And you've said yeah. to me before, you have to get comfortable in an environment of uncertainty if you want to be a great entrepreneur. Why? And how did you get comfortable in uncertainty? I think a thing that I believe now that I did not believe during the early part of the pillback journey, or honestly, probably into the last couple of years, is that there are folks that are on the sort of the extreme ends of this from a personality standpoint. Like, I think there are folks that 
truly are like much more comfortable in uncertainty than they are when things are are certain. And I think there's obviously folks way on the other end of that spectrum. And obviously a lot of folks are more in the middle. Um, but for me, I was way far on the like, I'm super naturally comfortable um, in an uncertain environment. It's kind of my happy place. It's not, so like, I don't have a lot of tactical advice on like, you got to meditate, you know, Monday to Friday from eight to nine. I didn't, there was not a lot of these mind games that I was trying to play. And so I think the advice I do have is like being really honest with yourself about where on that spectrum you are as a human, because I think if you like certainty and you like predictability and you like uh, that lifestyle, you honestly probably be happier at a big company. And if you like uncertainty, you're going to be miserable at a big company. Maybe it might make sense to go do something that's a little riskier um, and less about like the tactics of how to, how to sort of manage your psyche. But do you think most entrepreneurs today are uncomfortable with uncertainty? I'm giving a data point here, but from our portfolios, which are quite broad and diverse now, um, we've had six founding people from founding teams leave in the last month. I feel there's a real breaking of founder partnerships as times have got hard. Do you think founders are uncomfortable with uncertainty today? Uh, I think it, there's, it's plausible that there are a number of founders that uh, are in the role and might be more comfortable in a different type of in different type of role. You know, and but you have a lot more kind of broad perspective. Mine is very narrow, um, but I, I sort of have come to terms with the fact that I think it's very hard for like the classic overachiever that sat in the front row every you know in every class and always delivered papers on time and always got A's in every every one of their classes to go from that reality into a startup, which is re honestly like rewards a very different type of behavior and a different type of, of, uh, tactics. Um, and I think there are some folks that got swept up in the, the sort of perceived glamor of being a founder rather than the reality of, of that job. And so I, I, I do think it's, it, it, there is a big like founder fit in the gig. And I think being, being sort of super honest with yourself about who you are and what you, what you really enjoy and what environments make you happy, um, will probably is, you know, I think super important. I, I think terrible podcasts like this uh, glamorize entrepreneurship. And uh, if we showed the true <laughs> brutality of it, no one would ever fucking do it ever. Um, so that's not good for our business. Uh, but I, the other aspect that you said, as well as being uncomfortable, uh, being comfortable with uncertainty, is that as CEO, you have to set the vision and get out of the way. I thought this yeah. was interesting. Can you expand on this? And your biggest kind of lessons on doing this well yeah, I think this would actually be way harder for me now. Uh, I think, you know, I sort of pulled back, I was 26 and I had no preconceived notion that I had any idea how to do the tactical jobs better than the folks I was bringing in to do them, right? There was no, there was no way I knew how to, how to acquire customers better. There was no way I knew how to run operations better. There was no way I knew how to be a, a finance lead better than the people I was bringing in. I, the only technical training I had was in pharmacy, which had very little relevance to most of the things that a founder's doing. Uh, so honestly, there was a beauty in in being young and and not having experience in this context. How did you bring them in? You're young. You don't know their space better than them. How did you know what good looked like? Why do you think they joined a 26 year old, no offense, who didn't know what good looked like and only knew pharmacy? Yeah, you know, I do think I fo I was able to focus on the things that I thought I had to be good at, and I was sort of more naturally inclined to be good at, which was things like raising money and setting the vision and everything external. And we did have a big vision and it was a clear vision. So there was no muddiness around what we were trying to achieve. And it was, it was, it was a big vision. As far as understanding who was good and not good, I mean, a lot of it was intuition and trying to read people. And I think it's hard to articulate how to, how to manage intuition or how to be better uh, at reading people. But it was a lot of that. And then uh, it's plausible that I completely made the st statistic up. But at one point, somebody told me that the difference between the worst and the best hiring managers was that was roughly like, if you're if you're a terrible hiring manager, you're right like forty percent of the time, and if you're an amazing hiring manager, like world class, you're right like sixty five, maybe seventy percent of the time. And my takeaway from that was like, well, I better be really good at changing my mind if I'm wrong, and that's the only way to get to like ninety plus percent is if you hire someone that's not going to work out, be really quick at making that call and trying again. Um, and I took that to heart and I definitely, I definitely behaved that way as we built the team. I, I totally agree. And I get you. Can I just ask one, which is like, how do you determine whether someone just needs more time? This is something I struggle with. I think a lot of founders struggle with. People can take a while to get used to new environments, new decision-making structures. How do you determine between TJ enough's enough 
and hey, we should give them another two weeks. I mean, I was incredibly impatient. I mean, it's probably my biggest flaw is being pretty impatient. Um, I think for me, like once I once I was on that trajectory, I made the call. Like I didn't dilly dally around these things a whole lot. The only delaying was really because it's hard, right? It's like personally difficult to to do that. But I was very decisive on this stuff, um, and it it I think it came from the fact that I was just generally impatient as a as a operator. <laughs> Um, no, I, I totally get it. This, I think impatience is really important. I think, uh, and the trouble with Europe is we're very patient. Ah, tomorrow, tomorrow, yeah. we'll get we'll get on to execution. Yeah, but I do Americans try- are quite impatient folk. Yeah. Oh my God, nightmares. Um, uh, but what I want to ask is, you, you mentioned like your naivety bluntly across many aspects of the business when yeah. you were starting. Uh, naivety is often said to be, you know, a good thing, a bad thing by others. Is naivety good? or not? And if so, why yes or why no? Yeah, I always uh, said that I think Elliot and I were kind of in the perfect place personally when we started PillPack and we got very lucky in that sense. You know, I think we were absolutely not naive about the customer and about the, what the customer needed, what the customer wanted. Um, like we deeply understood that, but we were incredibly naive about the broader industry dynamics. Um, you know, we had no idea around, you know, incumbents and what they cared about and why all the things we wanted to do wouldn't actually work. You know, we looked at it and said, well, of course, we're going to make an awesome product and we're going to make this way better for customers. Um, and we're going to put it online and we're going to acquire customers online. This is going to be super straightforward. Um, and we were just woefully ignorant about uh, all the reasons it wouldn't work from an incumbent and industry standpoint. And I honestly think that's kind of the perfect balance. It's like, you got to understand the customer, but if you understand all the reasons it's not going to work, you're never going to start the company. Like if if I had been working in pharmacy for a decade as an adult, there's no way I would have started PillPack because there were very specific reasons it shouldn't have worked. And I think that's where the naivety is really powerful. Uh, if you don't understand the customer, you're, you're hosed. So you can't be naive there. Um, but I think it is important to not know all the reasons that the thing you're trying to do might not work. Okay. Help me out as an investor. I meet, sorry, ah, sounds awful, but I meet naive founders and I'm like, oh, so naive. When is naivety good and when is it bad? Because it can be bad. Yeah, well, a I think you have to be a pretty quick study. <laughs> you got to figure this stuff out as you uh, as you're building the company. So I think I imagine a lot of your job is figuring out how how able the founder is to roll with things. And so I think if you're just naive and you're going to stay there, it's probably going to be a huge problem. But again, I think it is about like the difference between not totally grokking industry dynamics and uh, grokking the customer. Um, you know, we took money from exclusively c- consumer tech investors. We weren't out pitching healthcare investors. I think almost every healthcare investor would have said no um, because of the fact that, you know, the industry dynamics were the way they were. So the investors were just as naive as us on, on a lot of the dynamics at play. Can I ask, when you got no's from, like, like, did you think, like, healthcare investors didn't get it and, like, they didn't see the future in the way that you did? No, it's probably a little different than that. I think I thought I didn't really need the help of healthcare investors. I think I thought I needed the help of consumer investors. And so it was sort of augmenting the things I thought I understood. Um, And it was less about whether they'd say yes or no for me. It was when you look at the pill pack business, yes, it's a, it's a healthcare company. It's a, it's a pharmacy. Um, We interact with payers. We do all the things that healthcare companies need to do. But I at least thought I knew how to do that. You know, like I'd, I'd been pretty involved in the space for a while. And the things I didn't know how to do were how to build a consumer brand, how to acquire customers, how to build world-class kind of consumer tech. Um, and so it was more about augmentation and the people that I wanted to be pushing me on the board. And it was less about getting to a yes or no. Can I ask, you mentioned impatience earlier. Um, I think, as we said, impatience is important because it plays a role in how fast you move and your speed of execution. How important a role does speed of execution play do you think i mean in this game it's kind of the only thing that matters right it's like how fast can you figure stuff out if you think about the the game that venture funded founders are playing and they're taking money and they've got roughly 18 months to figure something out that's really critical to getting to the next round of financing um and so if you can can move quickly what can you do to increase your speed of execution it goes back to hiring great people and mostly getting out of the way and giving them the autonomy to make decisions um, I think it is also being really explicit about which decisions are things that can be changed and need to be made really quickly and which decisions can't be changed and are really high consequence. Um, and I think if you find the right leaders and you build the right exec team, 
they'll mostly be able to parse those two things. And they'll certainly be, if it's even cuspy on the, on the bigger decisions, they'll be coming to you and you'll be working through it. Um, but for everything else, like people should have the autonomy to go. Like you should be hiring real doers that know how to execute. And then they should feel like they have the autonomy to make the call and, and go as fast as possible. Can you start from a relationship of full trust? Yeah. You know, it's funny you asked that. When we were acquired by Amazon, we, we sort of took all of our internal, the, the equivalent of Amazon LPs, like leadership principles, right? And we tried to mash them up kind of one-to-one with what's the equivalent, like Amazon one. And they actually like almost all tracked uh, sort of one-to-one, like customer obsession and all these things were, were kind of dead on. And the one that was, uh, was the exact opposite was we had this leadership principle at PillPack, which was my favorite, um, which was assume the best, right? So almost all your best relationships in life are about assuming the best in someone, not uh, assuming the worst, right? And so if you start from that frame, like you'll get rid of 90% of conflict by assuming that people are trying to figure it out and everyone's doing their best. Amazon's equivalent was earn trust, <laughs> which is the opposite leadership principle. And I didn't actually think a whole lot of it. Like we just tried, we mapped them. I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of the same, earn trust, uh, assume the best. In hindsight, that is like literally the opposite culture, right? It's like, it's kind of assume the worst until you're proven otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, I like, we built a culture that assumed the best, that, is, that, that we sh- people showed up, we made bets on people. Um, and then we assumed that they were going to execute and that they, and we trusted them. Like there was not this environment of like, did you ever make a big fuck up because of assuming the best? I, I listen to that and I think that's kind of naive. I don't mean it badly. I'm an earn trust. Yeah. And didn't, you know, it never backfired on us in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, and certainly there was a lot of goodness that came from it. So no is the short answer, but certainly could have been burned. Well, speaking of kind of the goodness that comes from it, you know, ultimately you want to achieve rapid decision making. In terms of achieving that culture of rapid decision making, other than like, assuming the best from day one, what works well in creating a culture of rapid decision-making and what really messes it up? Well, I think if you're making really critical, irreversible decisions rapidly, that will really fuck it up. Like, I think you'll make a lot of really bad decisions. And so, you know, I think for those, like, honestly, like I took as long as like humanly possible to make those critical decisions. And honestly, to some extent, to the frustration of my exec team throughout the course of the business, but a lot of times, like in a, in a very kind of mutually agreeable, productive way, honestly, like the best articulation of this out of everyone on my team was Elliot, who's my co-founder, who is amazing. And I'd say the, you know, the bigger decisions that we made over the course of the business were a byproduct of going on two hour walks three times a week for six months. Like we were, we were just batting these things back and forth for a very long time, sort of reticent to make the call. Um, and I think that's super important too. It's like, it's like a bifurcation of decision-making. It's like, if you can change your mind, just make those decisions as fast as humanly possible. Honestly, don't even bring them to me, just like go. And if you're wrong, we'll change your mind and we'll, we'll do it the other way. That's totally fine. But if it's something that's irreversible, like we're going to, we're going to work this one out until you're so frustrated that you feel so confident that it's the right decision that we'll know it's the right decision. Um, I think sometimes people, people sort of make all the decisions in the, in the, in the media instead of sort of bifurcating these things. Um, and I think that's super critical. Can you take me to a decision where you decided, uh-huh, we need to go slow on this. I need to spend time on this. And the exact team and everyone around you was going, oh, TJ, what was the decision that sticks out when I asked that? I mean, we'll get into this a bit more probably later in the podcast, but we had a number of run-ins with incumbents around our access to their networks over the course of the business. And I think we knew this was going to be a problem back in probably like middle of 2014 or something like that. And Elliot and I would just wrestle with nonstop. Is there a way to get in front of this? Is there a way to like get meetings and, and sort of try to work through this productively before it blows up in our face? And, the, and like we batted it around nonstop. And I think if you let your anxiety get the best of you, you would have made the call and just done something because you felt like you had to do something about it. Um, and in reality, we just sat on it and we let it, we let it ride. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the details of it later, but it, it ended up becoming like the, the, the make or break moment in the company. And I think it was the only way that we could have possibly uh, pulled off what we did pull off. What do you think is the single best decision you made with PillPack and what did you learn from it? I mean, it's hard for me not to say that it was starting the company with Elliot. I mean, he, he's been an amazing partner in the PillPack journey. Um, but I think it's hard to learn much from that other than be, it's sort of like better to be st- be lucky than smart. Uh, we didn't know each other that well. Like we had, we had done a couple things together, but 
we just got incredibly lucky. I think that probably the more useful answer to your question is we made this certainly at the time a weird decision that we were only going to focus on the end customer. Like we in healthcare, you've got payers, you've got providers, you've got other constituents, you've got the end customer. And honestly, it's the reason that most of healthcare is as fucked up as it is, is that almost no one is actually building for the customer that's that is using the service. And so we we effectively put on blinders to everybody else. Um, and so everything we're doing is to make this easier for the customer. And if we've got to do weird stuff to make that possible, um, that's totally fine. We'll do the weird stuff. Um, and if like a, a provider or a payer is upset about the way we're doing something, but it's better for the customer, sorry, like we're, we're building the thing for the customer. We're not actually building it for you. And that ended up being both incredibly critical um, and it enabled us to build an amazing service. Um, and I think we we argued about that all the time. Like we could have gone and got volume from a payer instead. We could have marketed through physicians. Like there's all sorts of ways we could have built the business. And the thing we never we never strayed from is that we're, the only thing we care about as a business is building for that end customer. Okay. I, I totally agree with you in terms of the importance of that focus and also what it does for you in terms of product marketing and messaging, having that concentrated and profile. If we think about the flip side, what was the worst decision where you're like, oh no, that we fucked up that one? I mean, I think one of the most difficult things as a founder is is finding the balance between doing things that don't scale and having uh, less experienced folks just cranking away and figuring things out versus when it's time to bring in some adults and when it's time to bring in kind of real operators. Um, and I think we messed up that balance and kind of in bringing in a head of finance, bringing in a head of ops at the right time. And it was incredibly painful, right? We're we're a deeply operational business. Um, and you know, we, we probably waited nine months to a year longer than we should have to bring in a real operator. Um, and that was just incredibly painful to get. When you say a real operator, is that, is that an exact team or is that a CFO? What do you mean by that? And what would you advise founders having had that experience and bad decision? Yeah, tangibly, we it was a CFO, COO, like one human that owned both of those functions that we brought in. Uh, this woman, Yvonne, who was incredible um, and really brought the business to a place where it was much more scalable and it was everything was humming. So she owned both of those functions, which obviously is is a bit rare. But tactically, we started the business. We had a we had a head of ops that um, I had known for a long time, but was young, hungry, like knew the business super well. Um, it was actually the first person I hired uh, in the pharmacy when we started the business. Uh, and he scaled that thing to four or 500 people, like zero humans to like 500 people or something in operations and like was more dedicated to the business and the customer than anyone I've probably ever met. Like I, I bet he slept in the pharmacy 40 days in one year uh, in the midst of this kind of scaling process and was just able to figure anything out, right? Like if something was going haywire, like he would find a way to figure it out. And that was amazing. That's like the perfect archetype of like an early operational leader is like they deeply know the domain. Their happy place is not like going and building unnecessary process. Their happy place is like, let's just go figure this thing out. But at some point that approach breaks, right? At some point you just get too big. It doesn't work anymore. Like you have to have the right systems and the right process and all that stuff. And I think he was so good that we like, we just went too far uh, with that approach. Uh, it's, it's a funny story, actually. I think the probably the, the worst uh, board meeting we ever had was the board meeting before Yvonne joined. Like everything was kind of breaking. Um, but at that board meeting, it was like, oh, no, no, no. Like everything is like really breaking, right? And But the problem was that we had hired Yvonne, but she hadn't started yet. Uh, so she came to the board meeting. And so it was this hilarious like dance between the investors and me and Yvonne where everyone knew it was broken and the investors were pissed, but they didn't want to freak out Yvonne because if Yvonne didn't show up, like we were way more screwed. So it was just like this hilarious, like emotional dance of how do we like, how do we say all the things we need to say in a way that like makes Yvonne excited to like fix all these problems and not so scared that she runs away. But for sure, that was like the most operationally painful moment in the business. Hey, everyone's left, but that's an opportunity for you to do something great, right? Perfect. I, I, man, You're I, love been... it. Coming into a perfectly well-oiled machine. I love it when you have like a multi-stage fund on the board early and you want them to do the next round. And so you're like, I know it looks bad, but I see this as an opportunity. <laughs> it's an opportunity. It's a great arbitrage for you. It's going to be great. 
Speaking of Yvonne and the timing there, when you think about exact teams, what should we front load first? Why? And how do you think about that? I always think about like each round for a classic venture back company as trying to be super crisp about the thing you're trying to prove on that round of financing, right? So like, obviously, like your first round of financing, you're doing a bunch of stuff. Like you got to build a product de novo, you got to sort of pseudo build operations, you got to build all the components. But like, what is the bet your investors are making? And do you have the right team to achieve like that single bet, right? Like you kind of have to put blinders on and be really, really thoughtful about what that is. So for us, we we raised the first round of financing. Like it was taken on face value that like, I knew how to open a pharmacy. I knew roughly what the economics were because we were in a similar business before. I knew how to build the product-ish because we had Elliot on the team and he had built products before. Um, the, the flyer everyone was taking is, can you acquire consumers online for this company, right? Uh, and so the only thing that mattered uh, sort of post that first round of financing was, can we actually acquire customers online for a pharmacy? Which if you jump back to like 2013, like starting a pharmacy is not what starting a pharmacy is today, right? There's... Row and Hims and PillPack and Capsule and TruePill, like there's all this great activity in pharmacy. In 2013, there was no, there were not pharmacy startups, right? So that was a weird thing to begin with. Um, and so I think that was the bet we were making. So to, to come back to your question, at that moment in time, it would have been weird for us to go hire like a really killer CFO and like a really amazing head of ops. Like that would be like awesome to build that exec team. It was like, we can kind of ignore that stuff, actually. Let's go, like, let's go build, like, go find the best, like, folks to help us figure out customer acquisition. And I think you have this journey in any startup, right? So, like, you get customer acquisition working, and then all of a sudden, ops are imploding, and now you got to go find a really killer operator. And I think you, you to some extent, have to be in reactive mode and less about, like, we're going to go find, like, a, a, a amazing exec, and they're going to build all this process and this function and be comfortable with, like, this is the only thing I care about for right now, and we'll, we'll figure that stuff out later. I, I totally agree with you there. I, I think the kind of the the hard thing is kind of when it comes to selection, like who do we decide to have on that team to help us? And you said before, um, I love this. Be very selfish about who's on the exact team. What did you mean by be selfish about it? And how do you advise founders on that? Yeah. I, so I think it's less about being selfish in the sense of like who you're recruiting. Uh, it's more. Like be selfish who shows up in that weekly meeting that you spend three hours going through the business. Um, because a good rule of thumb is like if you bring your head of HR and your head of legal and your head of finance and your head of ops, and like if you bring every one of the kind of leaders on the team into that room, you should take the three hours you have and divide it by the number of humans in that room and assume each one of them gets that amount of time to to talk, right? Uh, and so do you really want to spend a, a seventh of your meetings talking about uh, promotions and leveling and HR stuff? Or do you want to spend almost all that time talking about growth and product, right? And so like being really thoughtful about like who's in that room will determine like what are you spending your time in that sort of most critical moment debating? So for us, like, and this honestly wasn't intentional. It was just, it was a byproduct of who was on the team. But our, by the time we sold the company, you know, we've got a thousand people. We're doing a few hundred million in top line. The entirety of that meeting was me, uh, Yvonne, who was COO, CFO, legal HR, kind of all those functions. Elliot, who was product and tech. Jeff, who was BD and growth. And Colin, who was marketing and design, right? Like there was five of us in that meeting. And if you look at who the five were, like you're going to spend 85 to 90% of your time talking about product and growth. And the combination of HR, legal, ops, like all the tertiary functions get 10 to 20%, like 20% of the time in the meeting. And I think that was super critical. Like it just made us focus on the things that are ultimately going to drive a startup success. Obviously, like long term, you're a huge company. You do have to give more airtime to like these, these other functions. But a startup is about product and growth. Like that is the only thing that matters. And who on that team shows up, I think, determines what you're focused on as an entire organization. You mentioned the functional leads there, and you've tweeted before about kind of the difference between an org with kind of functional leadership versus an org with kind of GM leadership. Can I ask, how do you, for those that don't know, what's the difference between functional leadership or functional org versus GM org? What's the difference there first? Yeah, so functional org is roughly what I described, right? So if you look at the CEO and their exec team, each leader on that team is going to have a function. So you had a, you have a head of engineering, you had a, have a head of design, you have a head of product, 
You got to have a head of operations, a head of finance. Like it's it's very functional. Um, it's sort of like the the most simplistic, uh, straightforward org design. It's where most companies are going to start. Um, the a a GM focused org is where most big companies end up, right? So a GM focused org is where you've got single threaded leaders that in theory own a P and L, and under that leader they have a head of finance, a head of ops, a head of product, a head of tech. And so you end up having like hundreds of these GMs um, that manage a single P&L and have sort of pockets of each of these functions inside of their business. Um, and maybe somewhat controversially, I think the second you go to a GM-focused org, you're not a startup anymore. Like you are a big company. And almost all of the downsides of a big company that people bemoan, uh, the, the amount of HR, the amount of overhead and decision-making, like the, all the over-processedness, I think it's all a, a byproduct of that single decision. Um, and I think you it, you could not have built a company like Amazon or another large company without doing that, but it has all sorts of negative repercussions. And I think if you're a startup, like you're so far on the other side of that extreme that I think it's like more of a unnecessarily intellectual exercise to think about going to GM than it is about, than it is actually going to do any good for you. Um, and you can build huge companies that are functional. Apple is like a functional org. Um, so, yeah, that's my question. Like, I've interviewed, you know, leaders, functional leaders from Snap and LinkedIn in the last few days. These are big companies and public companies. Yeah, I would still say they very much run functional orgs. How should founders determine yeah. whether they should run a functional versus a GM led org? What's right for me? Yeah, I mean, I'm far on this extreme, but I think stick with functional until it's like so obvious that it just not can't possibly work that maybe there's an excuse to go to a, a GM focused org. Uh, and certainly if you've got like a manageable number of product lines, I wouldn't even like have the conversation. Like it's just not worth the debate. Uh, it is going to make your business worse and it might not do it right away, but it is definitely going to do it on the long term. I totally agree. I, I, GM led is just, um, it feels very formalized and too structured to me. I have to admit, I, I'm like a rabble. Yeah, against it's animals. honestly not even the, it's not the formalized. It's like, if you think about like all the things that that, all the extra process that that, creates right so like if you have a gm focused org like you now have to do all this work to make sure that like all of your eng twos are leveled at the same level because one's in this team and one's in that team and then don't talk at all and they have no idea what the other team's doing and so if they transfer from this team to that team you have to make sure that they're both as competent and you have to make sure that everyone's compensation is identical across 15 different businesses for the same level it is what creates like an enormous amount of hr work an enormous amount of like overhead because you're trying to do all these weird backflips to make sure that there's consistency in the business instead of just having a whole org of engineers and a whole org of designers where that stuff just comes in kind. I also feel like you're creating this kind of dysfunctional decision making because you have kind of CEOs on top of CEOs. Like, you know, your, your GM who yeah. runs that segment isn't actually the ultimate decision maker. They can still get overridden by, you know, the CEO up top or the CPO who's ahead of them, who's just in the... And so you create this very strange chasm between power, ultimately. Yep. And you just don't have your best people on every product, right? Like if you've got your head of product and your head of engine, and your head of design, working on every product, they're going to be better. Just like de facto going to be better products. Man, you mentioned comp as one of the reasons like it can be challenging. What are some of your biggest lessons on, yeah. on comp and equity and how it can be used most effectively by founders? I didn't appreciate this nearly as much as I probably should have at the time. Um, but incentivizing your team as much as possible on equity ends up being like the biggest lever you have from a cultural standpoint. Obviously, it's a lever from an economic standpoint. But if you take kind of PillPack pre-acquisition versus PillPack as part of a big organization, PillPack pre-acquisition, like I don't think I ever once had a conversation about leveling someone or promoting someone in a meaningful way that was going to dramatically change their comp. Like, we bet on people, we gave them a big equity package the day they started, um, and we expected them to deliver on that equity package. And so like everyone either won as a team or we lost as a team. Like there was no point in trying to go carve out some way for you as an individual on that team to win in a way that mattered. Um, and so everything kind of falls out of that. Like we, we're going to win or we're going to lose. We're all aligned like from an economic standpoint. You get to be a big enough company, even if it's technically equity and it's it's stock. Um, it is rational to care far more about like your own career pathing 
and the next promotion and all of those things than it is to care about winning or losing. And so it is like the biggest lever a startup has culturally. Um, and I, I, I you appreciate that, that in but a I don't... macro turn though. Yes. And what I mean by that is like, bluntly, what I see now today in particular, people want cash. When times get tougher, they want cash, equity, not so much. I, I see that in Europe as well. Do you think that's fair or no? Yeah, you're they, should wrong go work, they should go work at a big company then. Like, that's fine. Like, that's not the game we're playing. Like, I, I, like, startups are about like pulling something off that's incredibly difficult and everyone doing incredibly well if you pull it off. And that's not cash. So it's just a different game. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Um, I, I want to dive into a couple of elements of the story, uh, which I think are really important. Like, as we said before, it's very easy to look at PillPack and think, oh, all up and to the right, billion dollar sale. Life is good. There's always early hiccups. What were the single biggest early hiccups you really remember and stick out to you? Yeah, I talked a little bit about that sort of first bet, right? Like we're, we we started the company, we raised about $4 million between two quick rounds right out of the, right out of the gate. Um, and the bet people were making is that we can acquire customers. Like everyone assumed we'll start a pharmacy. They assume we'll get in, in network with payers. Like all that stuff was a given. Uh, so if you jump forward, we, raised, we started the company in 2013. Um, we raised that round kind of middle of 2013. Um, and we launched the product in early 2014. Um, and for folks that were around at that time, like the way you acquired customers was buying Facebook ads, like point blank. But that's how every DTC company was scaling. Um, and so we assumed like we're going to do the same thing. We're going to buy Facebook ads and like hopefully the economics work and hopefully we can acquire customers in this category and we launched, we got our ad, uh, our ads turned on. And I think within, and they were working, right? Like we were acquiring customers at a number that was lower than we promised. And we're like, oh my God, it's working. This is great. And out of nowhere, our account got shut off. We got like suspended from Facebook ads. And we're like, uh, this is not good. Uh, and you know, their wonderful customer service was very helpful, as you can imagine. Um, and they told us at the time, like, actually, you can't advertise pharmacies on Facebook. Like, sorry, like you can't do that. And so picture this, right? Like you're, we're a new e-commerce pharmacy. Like we're going to build an amazing digital experience and you lose like the single digital channel that every company is building their business on the back of at that, at that point. Uh, and so, and we had us all this back and forth. Uh, and finally we got them to agree that if we got this thing called VIPs, which was like this, which was this accreditation for online pharmacies that then we could advertise uh, on Facebook. Which is great, great news. It's now like I don't know March of 2014 or something, um, and we go, we contact Vips, and we're like, hey, we need to get this accreditation, and accuse like, who we are, and it's like, cool, yeah, here's the process, and they sent us this long like overview of all the the things we had to do to get the accreditation, and like on average, it takes about 12 months to get this accreditation. We're like, oh god, like we don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't have 12 months to figure this out, um, and so you know, I think. From a financing standpoint, uh, we got incredibly lucky because, and this is not usually a lucky turn of events, but Fred at the time had been at Accomplice, which was a fund in Boston and led the Series A from there. Fred left Accomplice and went to Excel and he knew the company super well. Obviously, he he liked the business and he just knew that this was going to work. Um, and he took a flyer and he he made a bet on, on PillPack in September of 2014 before we had any real customer acquisition working. Like we were... Yeah, you know, we were we were hacking our way to get some customers, and the product was working. Um, he he then led the round in twenty in the kind of back half of twenty fourteen. We also let in the folks from Slow Ventures into that round, who were early Facebook folks for this reason. Um, we got Vips probably September October of twenty fourteen, so a bit faster than normal, but it still took six or eight months or something like that. Um, and then within a matter of weeks, we had our account. Once you got it, was Facebook as impactful as you thought it would be? To customer yeah, acquisition. Yeah, so we, we turn. So we raised that nine million dollar round in September. Ads on probably like October or something like that. And I'd say within like three weeks, it was a whole different situation. Like we turned the account on. Customers were signing up at a CAC that we were happy with, and we just started turning the knob, and the business started growing. Like it was that straightforward. Um, and from like the back half of fourteen through the mid fifteen, it was just like. It was just scaling and we raised a $50 million around six months later or something because uh, it was just going at that point. I mean, this nicely, but like $9 million when you didn't really have any customer acquisition going, did you get an absolutely torrid like structure to that no. deal? Like dilution wise, as an investor, that must have been brutal. I think the practical answer to your question is we raised like a nine on 30 post or something with no structure. 
got you. Okay. So, so, like, so kind of like no structure, but yeah, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, I think like that was market ish. This was not 2018, 2019. Uh, but it was fine. Like, you know, like I've never once looked back and be like, oh my God, I got so deluded. Like I could have so much more money right now. Uh, like that's just silly. Like it, it worked out great. We raised around and we moved on and then we raised around, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred pre nine months later. And so like those things, that one was probably way too frothy. And the one before was, was low maybe, I guess, but like at the aggregate, it was fine. Like, can I ask, I heard so many things from Fred about Bluntly, your process of design for the first physical products. When you go back to that, what are your biggest lessons from the V1s and the early product designs? What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were doing them? Yeah, I think the thing that we definitely did right that I feel really good about was was actually deeply caring about the physicality of the product. I, I think it's hard to put yourself back in 2013 land, uh, but at the time, like, there wasn't a lot of these like well-designed CPG consumer businesses that existed. And the only reason we cared so much about it was that I, I just, I just liked it. I cared about it. I thought it was cool. Um, and we, we actually hired IDEO um, and worked with them. We, we camped out with them for the first three or four months of the product design process. And they did all of the work with us on the physicality of that product. Obviously, the, the the sort of physical packaging, the uh, the packets themselves were were already... The functionality was designed, but all the energy went into how do we make this as simple and beautiful and pleasant an experience as possible. And honestly, the, the physical product today, which is now almost a decade later, is exactly the same as it was when we designed it the first time around. Um, and so it's really stood the test of time. It's, it's right back there. I think. It's a permanent dispenser. Um, but I'm super proud of it. And I'm proud of the thing we designed before we were even... Uh, before you even launch the product. And I think it's a place where you, it's really important to punch above your weight as a startup, which I think is taken at, at face now. But I think in 2013, that was not, uh, that was not as common. I, I, you mentioned punching above your weight. I have to touch on the element you said earlier, being kind of incumbent responses. Incumbents respond in uh, varying ways. I hear there's an interesting story here. How did incumbents respond to you when things started to hum? And take me to that story. I'm intrigued. I don't know the answer yeah. here. I don't know this, so tell me more. Yeah, uh, so I'll try to keep this uh, as as uh, understandable and non-wonky as possible, but apologies if I get in the weeds a little bit here. So I think the place we were woefully naive at, at PillPack we found the company was this, right? We didn't really understand why there were more e-commerce, co- like e-commerce pharmacies. Like every other category, there's all these big winners in pharmacy. There's basically, there was no e-commerce player before PillPack. Like they didn't exist, right? There's CVS and Walgreens, there's PBM owned mail order pharmacies. There's no e-commerce business. Uh, well, that's weird. Like we should just build this. This will be great. Uh, we're build a great customer experience and it's going to, it's going to be awesome. And there are the things called PBMs, um, which stand for pharmacy benefit managers. Um, and they are companies like Express Groups, uh, CVS Caremark, OptumRx. Um, and they're kind of the equivalent of insurance companies, but only for your prescription drugs. And historically, they were in two different businesses. One was managing your benefits. So how much is your copay? Which pharmacies can you use? How much is your out-of-pocket? Which medications are covered? Like all the things an insurance company does. And then the other half of their business uh, was owning and operating mail-order pharmacies. So they did home delivery for consumers. Uh, And so obviously, they weren't particularly thrilled about other companies competing with them in that second category, right? They had a, a captive market on doing home delivery in pharmacy. And this is the single reason. Aren't you fucked? Because like, if they're the ones who are saying, hey, we'll own the, the transaction mechanism, we're the insurers of these prescriptions, and we're not going to give pill pack license, aren't yes, you fucked? Yes, yes, you are fucked. This is why I say you would have never started this company if you knew how the industry dynamics work. It's why no healthcare investor would have invested in this company. Like, this is idiotic. Like, there's no way these guys are going to let you in their network. Like, the but I, 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 I'm a tech investor, and respectfully, I like that's like the most cool thing. The cool supply side can't engage because it cannibalizes oh, yeah. their I own was, business. I was horribly confident that this would be a non-issue. Like, oh, like I, I'm, I've run pharmacies before. You decide you fill out the paperwork, you get a network with the insurance companies. Like, it's fine. And like, that's actually what we did. Like, we started a pharmacy, and we got a network with all the insurance companies, and it was totally fine. Right. So, like, 2013, 14, first half of 2015, like. We were in network as a small little independent pharmacy, like any other independent pharmacy, and they didn't care, right? Like, why would they care? We're doing like 
very small amounts of volume. They didn't even know who we were, frankly. We filled out like very administrative paperwork to get a network. And then- What changed? We got our Facebook ads turned on <laughs> and the company started scaling and started growing really quickly. And of course, they see every transaction that you process because they are the transaction processor. Uh, and then things change quickly, right? Like we get to the middle of 2015, we went from, I don't know, $10 million run rate to like a $70 million run rate in like six months, nine months, something like that. And then they started really caring, right? And so now, like, everyone knows who PillPack is. Uh, and we got very lucky. We got this guy, Jim Messina, who was Obama's deputy chief of staff, uh, joined our board. And he joined our board explicitly to help us navigate regulatory and incumbent issues like this. And he's very good at this. And through 2015, uh, we got termination notices from all of the major PBMs, right? Very obviously. Mm. And... I would say every one of them but Express Scripts, we worked through in a very kind of private, uh, professional way with them. And net net, we maintained access, we maintained coverage, um, mostly because we were already serving their customers and their customers liked the product and it would have been very painful for them to take it away was the sort of base of that. But then early 20s... Could you... Do you not have been more aggressive and just taken vertical ownership and done the payment processing impossible. yourself too, and then like actually really impossible. removed yeah. some? It's not just payment processing. Why? It's like all they're, 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 they're the equivalent of like you can think about like a PBM or honestly kind of a payer in general as like the demand aggregator in healthcare, right? Like they own that demand, they own the employer relationships, um, they have the Medicare relationships. Like you would have had it, you, as a startup, you could not have built what they had built, um, unless you're building an entirely different company. You can't do it at, when we're building the equivalent of a retailer, like literally impossible. And so it's early 2016, um, Express Scripts uh, sent us a termination notice. Honestly, it looks the same as all the other termination notices we had received. And we had managed quietly and figured out. And we we reached out to them the same way we did with the others and tried to get a meeting and try to help figure it out. And we had two weeks, right? So the termination notice states like, in two weeks, you can no longer serve Express Scripts customers. Like you can't process transactions. Uh, for context, they are the largest PBM. So this was like 40% of our revenue. Um, and as far as we knew, in two weeks, like that revenue goes to zero. And so after, a w- like we spent a week just trying to get in touch with somebody and they were just radio silent, like would not even engage with us. Um, and so we made the pretty aggressive decision to start a public war. And so Colin Rainey, who had started like three days before, I think he was on a cross-country flight, uh, designed like a full uh, explainer video that it talks about what a PBM is, what they do, why this matters. Uh, and then we, we filmed a customer testimonial of one of our customers. And I think within two days had 1,400 or 1,500 like customer testimonials. Um, and these weren't like, oh, like it'd be so sad to lose PillPack. Like I love the packaging. It was like, if we lose PillPack, like I'm going to have to put my mom into a home and like we don't really know actually what we're going to do. Um, and it was 1500 of these, right? Um, and so we built a whole website, uh, fixpharmacy.com, had all the customer testimonials on it, had the explainer video, the customer video. Um, and then we had all this like wonky stuff for regulators if they wanted to like drill into what was going on. And then we just did a massive PR blitz. So we launched the site. I think we had 40 articles in like two hours. Um, and we leaned super heavy on like, this actually is going to be really bad for these customers. Like this isn't like a, David and Goliath, like hopefully one of the businesses wins and one loses. Like this is going to be super bad for, for the customers that are using this service. <clears throat> and uh, and then we ran a, like a regulatory uh, process and tried to do what we could do. Um, and I think within 24 hours, Express which was at the table. And then it gets even crazier. So we're now like, I don't know, it's like a, it's like five days later. And we've got two days to get this contract fixed. And like now it's now it is a business negotiation. We're trying to find a path for it with Express Scripts. Um, I don't think anyone's heard this story ever. Um, but Elliot and I are sitting in a conference room uh, with Colin, um, who again is pretty new to the space. I'm sitting on my laptop. We're like the war room, right? We've got all the site design on the walls. It's just like a classic war room. And I get an email from like the equivalent of our GPO for like all of the other PBMs. Like you kind of have a like a GPOE type thing that sits between you. And they're like, hey, like we saw this Express Script stuff. Like this seems bad. Like actually, like we're going to kick you out too. Uh, and so we were 48 hours from going from like, I don't know what it was, 100 million in revenue to zero. Like zero. We have to now both, I have to go figure out how to like fix the Express Scripts thing 
and Elliot, uh, and we got to go figure out how to like fix all of the other contracts like at the exact same time. Uh, and so I'm sitting there, I get the email, like I don't say anything. I just like turn the computer around to Elliot who looks at it and is just like, we, we say nothing for probably like three minutes and Colin's sitting like, Hey guys, like what's going on? Uh, the two of us walk out and I'm like, Elliot, like you got to figure out this GPO thing. Like, I don't know how we're going to deal with that, but you got to figure it out. And I was like, I'll figure out express scripts and like, we'll figure it out. And by Friday night, which was the kind of, that was the end for both. Uh, Elliot had found a new GPO, done all the tech work and administrative work to flip into it. And I had signed a new contract with Express Scripts. Um, and we had like, we had not lost a single contract and we had solidified ourselves like publicly as a company that was going to exist in the space, like in perpetuity. Um, so it was definitely a, it was as live or die as you're ever going to see. And yeah, it was sort of, that was what that sort of make it moment for the for the business are you panicking at that point that is a holy shit moment are you well, how do you keep your cool like, TJ? I, like I have a personality that when things get really intense like i get calm i don't the opposite doesn't tend to happen so it was incredibly stressful but like i also felt like i was kind of in my element and like there was like an enjoyment and like this is like kind of like it's 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 a battle and we're going to figure it out. And we're like, we're playing a chess match here. And, uh, certainly was stressed. I certainly was not sleeping well. Um, but at the same time, like there was like a, uh, an enjoyment to it. And when, when obviously when we pulled it off, like it solidified the business in a way that we couldn't have done in any, any other way. Um, and similarly, like this is one of those decisions that like, I think if you were a little too anxious and you want to make the decision, like, you would have wanted to get ahead of this one. Like you would have wanted to like, ah, we should go do some BD deal with them. Like, let's figure this out. And I was like, nope, none of that felt right. Like what's not going to work. Like, let's just play this out and see how it, ha see how it plays out. And I don't think there was any other path, uh, to pulling this off than the one we took. Um, but you could have also never like architected this path. Um, it was just building something great for customers. And when it mattered, those customers came and kind of defended the, the access that they had. TJ, why on earth did they relent? What what made them pull back? Uh, I mean, I think it was it it was there was no excuse from a customer standpoint, right? Like it was all uh, in fighting between businesses. Um, and honestly, like I should caveat this all now that like now that Pillpack and Amazon Pharmacy are like real players, like we actually have. We when I left Pillpack in September, we had a great relationship with Express Scripts. Uh, we launched the Prime discount program with them. Um, and, and we flipped from like this little knit that, uh, they could just squash to like a partner. And so like these things sort of have, they run their course. Um, but net net, like those relationships now are sound and good. And, um, we can now kind of build stuff that that ends up being good for customers. I, you mentioned Amazon now. I, I have to ask, you know, in 2018, I think it was, uh, Amazon, you know, reportedly, uh, attempt to acquire and successfully do, um, for a very large number. Talk to me about the decision-making process there. That comes in. What's the decision-making like and how did you get to the deal? Yeah, so if you zoom back to that moment, I think it was like mid-2017, early 2017 probably. We had just finished overhauling like all the software that powered the pharmacy. So we when we started the company, we just bought everything off the shelf, right? And over time, we sort of ripping components out and ripping components out. Um, and by early 2017, we had rebuilt um, and ripped out all of the underlying tech um, in that power of the pharmacy. Uh, and we had this moment where we like, kind of picked our heads up and we're like, what should we what should we do now that we've done that, right? Almost all our resources have been focused on that for the longest time. Um, and we had this idea of like, could we offer our infrastructure up to other participants, right? So it could be another startup that needs to launch a pharmacy experience, actually row launched on our infrastructure. Um, and we were offering like this as like a fulfilled by Amazon kind of B2B business based on the fact that we had the tech, the insurance contracts, the licensing, like the infrastructure. Um, and as part of that, we were meeting with all the large retailers and other potential customers to build on top of that, right? And one of those large retailers went from like a very commercial uh, uh, conversation to an acquisitive conversation like relatively quickly. And by kind of fall of 2017, that had... How do you know when it's going to an acquisition from a partnership in a normal conversation? Do they say, hey, we want to buy yeah, you? Yeah, usually like, when they call and say, hey, could we just buy the company? It's, it's pretty clear it moved from like a, a commercial thing to like an acquisitive thing. Uh, I, you know, like I wasn't like I wasn't reading the tea leaves at the same time, but uh, 
but it was pretty explicit at that point. Um, and, you know, I think we looked, we looked at where we were and a couple of things had happened. One, like we, we were now like a, a, a version of scale, right? Like a couple hundred million in run rate or something like that. And we had a very good sense of like what our economics were and what it was going to take to build what we really wanted to build. Uh, and from that standpoint, like it was going to be pretty capitally intensive to scale this thing to the extent that we wanted to, right? Like it was doable. Like we could have definitely built an independent company, but it was going to be uh, capitally intensive. Um, and then probably more uh, importantly, like when we started Build Back, like it was a very simple vision, which is just make this easy as possible for consumers. And I think as we started pulling on that string over the years, like we had all these incumbent issues and everything else, we were more ambitious, right? Like we wanted to fix the supply chain. We wanted to fix a bunch of other stuff in the industry. And we had gotten convinced the best way to do that was to make pharmacy a shop- shoppable like e-commerce experience. And a bunch of stuff falls out of that that ultimately re- reshapes the the dynamics. Um, and so the combination of those two things, like the best place to do that is at a large retailer that already exists. Um, and so it was, it was pretty straightforward. And uh, we made the decision, assuming that the, the terms came to a place that made sense, that we would probably sell the company in like the back half of 2017. Okay, so you decide that you're going to sell a company in the back half of 2017 and it needs a lot of cash to get it to the scale that you think it can be. And then it's like, okay, there's a process to run. How did you think about running that process? You mentioned there the early interest. I'm sure there was many other interested parties. How did you run that process? And what was that decision making on Ultimate Acquire? Yeah, so we, uh, and I th- you know, I think this was somewhat public uh, in the middle of the process, but that same initial kind of retailer that had flagged they wanted to buy the company got to terms that we were comfortable with. And we spent some time with other acquirers, but it was clear that they were they were the lead horse and it was probably the right fit and the, the best option. Um, and so we were, this was kind of early 2018, um, and we had, I don't know, six months of runway in the bank or something. Um, and so normally that's when I would have raised around, right? Like you'd raise 18 months, you'd then probably raise when you've got six months of runway left, something like that. Um, and so we had started a fundraising process in January of 18. Um, and then within a few weeks of that going, we got to terms with a potential acquirer and we assumed we were going to sell the company to that acquirer. And so we shut down the fundraising process. We sort of full steam ahead on getting the deal done. Honestly, we were days like not weeks from being done like announcing uh, like this thing is done like definitive agreement like done uh and it hits a snitch or it hits a snag and it's going to get delayed um and so now like the whole board thinks we're selling the company in like three days i think we're selling the company in like three days um and now it's not going to be three days it's going to be some unknown amount of time and now instead of having like six months of money in the bank i've got two months Maybe because like we're selling the company in three days, like I had two months of money is great. You perfectly timed it. Um, and so uh, I had to tell the board, obviously, uh, so I get a phone call on Thursday night. I tell the board on a Friday morning um, and we've now got to go. I sort of pick back up the fundraise. So like I'm flying to San Francisco Monday morning. I'm going to New York on Wednesday and then maybe I'll go to see if I can get a, a meeting in Seattle with some other potential acquirer uh, by the end of the week. Uh, and that's what I did. So I got on a plane and I, Went back and met with all the potential uh, funders, not acquirers, and told them what happened. I thankfully, like, we'd shared all our numbers in like December, January, and we'd beat all those numbers in now, like April or whatever this was. And so, like, that's better than if we had missed them uh, for sure. And it was kind of like, you know, we're up for anything. Like, we'll figure something out here. Like, but we don't have a ton of time, so let's just like be creative. Um, then I had the meeting with uh, the company in Seattle, and it was definitely the best pitch in my life. And uh, we were just mono a mono, and I I think I at that point I knew we were selling the company to Amazon. Like all of our uh, vision around what to do with pharmacy and how to make it shoppable and all those things, we were just super aligned. Um, and at that point, you know, I knew we were going to sell the company to Amazon, and ultimately we did, and and uh, it was a great outcome. How do you come to? Sorry, I'm so naive. How do you come to a price? Do you sit across the table and be like, I want a billion, and they're like, Okay, great, good for good for you, I. How, what does that look like in terms of that negotiation That's process? A dance. By the end, like, yeah, I sat on the phone and said, I want a billion. That's definitely what happened. But, you know, getting to the the first deal was just, a, it was a dance and it was about where the different companies valued, where the investors' positions, like what's an economic outcome that's good for everybody. And if we can't get there, we're just not going to do a deal. It's not like we had to sell the company. We could have raised another round and kept going. Um, and so that was more of a dance. By the time it got to 
doing the deal with Amazon, like ultimately it was a phone call that was like, if you hit a billion, we're done. Um, and they hit a billion and we were done. But you know, that's the byproduct of lots. Can I start? I'm, 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 na- I'm naive again. When you have a deal like that and you can tell me if I'm asking too many questions, is it like a billion and you get the cash? Is it like a billion and earn outs? How do deals yeah, get I mean, structured? They're all different. Even like, so we had three potential buyers. Uh, each structure was different, whether they bought the whole thing or most of the thing or whether it was all up front or there was some earn out. And there were varying degrees of those things. Um, but I would say by and large, every deal is going to have some of the money up front and some of earn out. Um, and so I think we announced in June, no money then because like you haven't closed yet. There's this whole like regulatory process and everything that takes some time. Um, so I would say like for entrepreneurs, that moment from announcement to close is, is a relatively stressful uh, period of time. Uh, but I think we announced in June, we closed. It's also weird though, because your friends think you're loaded and you're like, no, no, I don't actually have any money. Yeah, like, well, you're definitely not loaded yet. There's plenty of deals that blow up in uh, in closing, not typically for diligence, but more for, uh, for government oversight reasons. Um, but then we closed in September. Then yes, like a lot of money hits your bank account. Uh, in order of magnitude, more money than that. Is it hit your bank account in one go? And can you just take me to the moment when you saw your bank account? Like, were you on a, a in the garden with the kids? Where were you when you saw it hit? For me, the moment that was more like uh, endearing was like was telling the team, which is the same exact time, right? Like, uh, no, that isn't the same time. That's later. Okay, so we told the team that was better. Uh, my dad was there. My mom was there. Like, all of the companies that traded. Uh, in pharmacy, in the public markets drop by like 15% in like three minutes. Uh, so it was the very, that moment was honestly for me, was like, was better than when the money hit my account. Like it was just like such a moment. Um, and the money hit my account, it was just a lot of refreshing. Like it is anytime lots of money hits your account. Um, and then it was. Like, Where were you? Were you at home? Were I you in the office? Remember. Were you with your wife? I don't remember, crazily. Uh, I certainly remember where I was when we announced the deal, but I don't know where I was when we, when the money hit the account. I've heard quite a few people say, I, I, bizarre, you're a weird bloke, TJ. Uh, I'd be like, I was here. I remember my heart rate, my temperature. At that point, it was like such a given it was going to happen. I, yeah, I don't remember. Can I ask, I've, I've heard people say, like, it's kind of a shame. Like, TJ's a once in a generation founder. The company could have been 20, 30 billion reinventing healthcare on its own. Do you have any regrets about selling? No. I really don't. I mean, that might be true. It's not like I'm not saying that that's not possible, but you know, we set out to like start pull back. Like we just wanted to make pharmacy better. Like that was the ambition. Uh, and when we sold the company to Amazon, like I deeply wanted to build like a shoppable pharmacy experience. And we did that. Like we built and launched Amazon pharmacy and that's humming along. And I'm super proud of that work. Um, we also were able to build and launch Amazon clinic, which is like a 3P marketplace for telemedicine providers. And there's lots of other stuff that I think will be, a byproduct of our thinking and what we built at Amazon to say nothing of the fact that the thing we built and the work we did at Amazon, it's now, it's the only big tech company that's actually providing healthcare and doing real things in healthcare. And so that's a legacy that I'm super proud of um, and really happy about. And economically, like I don't ever look back and, and wish I had kept going and it all could have been so much bigger and so much better. Um, just super happy with the outcome. Two things. We always hear money doesn't make you happy. Money doesn't make you happy. Does money make you happy, TJ? Uh, time makes me really happy and money provides you a lot of extra time. Um, so I'm pretty happy. Um, I, I'd say like, it's hard to parse. Like when I started the company, I had no family, no kids, like none of that. And now I've got three little kids and an amazing family and, uh, super happy with where we live. So I'm super happy. I don't know how much of it's the money or the time or, or neither. And it's just the family, but I'm quite happy at the moment. No regrets for me. I, I love that. Can I, can I ask you, what's been the most lavish purchase since TJ? I have expensive taste, but I'm not going to go through a laundry list of things I bought. Uh, probably the most, technically the most lavish is we bought this, uh, we bought like a 12 acre farm in the middle of Park City, which we're building. My wife is building like a, an amazing farm here. We're going to have a bunch of animals and a bunch of fresh produce in the backyard. And so uh, it's a practical, but quite lavish purchase and uh, one that I'm excited to to build. When you look at your Twitter... It seems like Amazon maybe wasn't what it seemed. Is that an unfair response? And do you think your negativity online fairly reflects the experience? I think the negativity is probably a little overstated. It's more of like an eh, eh, eh. When we, when we sold the company to Amazon, my goal was to build and launch PharmacyN.com. 
and make all those like very non-data-driven, like nuanced decisions, like intuitive decisions to get that thing off the ground and then hand it off to an Amazonian that knows how to turn the crank and really build like a, a scaled business in a way that I honestly just don't. Um, I don't think Amazon is any worse than any other big company, but it is a big company. Uh, and it comes with all the trappings of a big company. Um, and I think for me, given like the very beginning of our conversation where it was like, do you like stability and do you, are you comfortable with authority and do you like, uh, predictableness or not? I am so far on this extreme that honestly, like, I don't think I would be super successful at any big company. I'm, I'm a startup guy, but just kind of how it is. Um, and so no, like functionally thrilled it'll be built. Um, and Amazon is a big company. <laughs> So quick fire round, following what we just said there, what's the single best thing about being an Amazon? Uh, how happy it makes me to not be at Amazon anymore. I love that one. Listen, uh, next one. What do others not know that you know to be true? Uh, that I think that customers are ultimately going to shop healthcare like they shop everything else. And that until, until that happens, like healthcare is going to remain as fucked up as it is right now. What's the biggest advice on effective board management? I think just be a normal human, like create normal relationships with your investors and your board members, text them, call them when things are good and bad, get breakfast, make David Tish buy you sushi, like do all the things that you do and great relationships in the rest of your life with your investors and your board members and uh, it'll probably be fine. I love Tish. Uh, what's the strongest belief you had which turned out to be wrong? Uh, I used to think that people could like float between different types of companies and and jobs pretty seamlessly and it would be fine. Uh, and per like some of the earlier conversations, I think that like you should really optimize for what your personality is best at. Um, like I said, that you're both really successful and really happy in a huge company and then also really successful and really happy in a startup is unlikely. Um, and so I think I've changed the, my tune on that one. Who's the single most impactful angel of the pill pack journey? I mean, I think you got to give it to the the first person that ever bet on you, which for us is Katie Ray and Zenchu. Uh, and Katie was the one that was running Techstars and we got into Techstars. Like she bet on us before anybody else. And so it's hard for me to not give that, uh, that kudos to Katie. What would you most like to change about the world of venture? Uh, I'd really like for like 20 somethings that have never built a business to stop like pontificating on how to build a business. Just kidding. <laughs> love you, Harry. My, my, my son's name is TJ, Harry. He's named after you. I love you. I'm just kidding. No, do you know what though, TJ? And it is the most frustrating thing for me, which is like people who think that, which I totally understand from the outside. But it's like you don't see two 10 million a year revenue businesses with 80% margins. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I built a really the, terrible business people. with like 20% margins. So you're better than me. No, I'm not saying that, but it's like, yeah, it's perception and reality. And tell me, my friend, you can have one board member. Who's the best and why them? I got to give that one to Elliot Cohen. He was definitely my best board member. We were always perfectly aligned. We're going to do TJ in 2033. Yeah. Why are you then? I don't buy that you're enjoying the farm yeah, and just farmer like taking with in the three pressure. teenage kids running around, having a good time. I had the best honey to the west of the Mississippi. Like, it's going to be great. Uh, but more seriously, I hopefully get the opportunity to keep, to keep being involved in building things that make people's lives better. I mean, I think it was super rewarding to build PillPack. I'm still young. I got a I got a lot more in me. So hopefully, still building, uh, still building, and helping build things that uh, that make people's lives better. TJ, I love this. You SaaS master. <laughs> that is brilliant. I, honestly, I love doing this. I'm so touched that you you chose to do this as your first thing speaking publicly. Seriously, it really meant a lot to me. And so, thank you so much, my friend. Of course, it was my pleasure.